All right. Hi, um, Ilana, thank you so much for joining me for this interview. Um, so today is August 20th of uh, 2020, and I, this is Fernando Espinosa. I am interviewing you for the uh, pandemic project at the Archives of American Art at Smithsonian Institution. Um, and if you can just uh, introduce yourself, please. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Ilana Savdi. I am originally from Colombia um, and have been living in New York for about 11 years uh, and currently am based in New Haven out of the uh, Next Haven residency. So I'm currently in my studio at Next Haven. Great, thank you. Um, so as you know, uh, we've been talking to different artists to get a sense of how they have been experiencing these very shifting uh, and different times. Um, can you just tell us how you've been doing um, in the past few months, uh, basically since the pandemic started? Um, yeah, that's been, it's been tricky because t the past few months have just felt like every week I've had to kind of recalibrate completely. Like every week feels like something seismic happens and there's a constant sense of needing to recalibrate. Um, so I think when, and sort of finding a new normal. So I think at the beginning, um, when the pandemic first started, I think, and the world was sort of brought to a halt, um, my fears and my anxieties were kind of very much located in the possibility of different administrations like seizing power and that sort of um, things like curfews or lockdowns or invasive surveillance and the, watching the government kind of constantly fail to anticipate and respond um, was it was just it was really overwhelming and it felt kind of like this reminiscent of the sort of dystopian uh, future that I've read about or seen in movies. It just was kind of an overwhelming thing. Um, and so the kind of need to constantly recalibrate and reevaluate what's important to me and how to kind of handle these moments um, has been, it's just, it's been essential to kind of keep doing that. Um, I have been finding myself most grounded when I come to my studio. And I'm very lucky to be in a program that, that's allowed me to do that and given me the space and time to do that. So, so it's kind of been this like push and pull between feeling like this kind of creative charge and also feeling this overwhelming sense of dread and anxiety around, you know, this kind of extraordinary moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're sharing um, the space with other artists, fellows um, in New Heaven right now. How was it for you to experience all of these uh, while in a space like that? Um, and I imagine, you know, away from your net your usual networks and family and connections. Yeah, it was. A, it's been interesting because I've been. I already. I had just arrived here. I think a month before. Um, the pandemic hit in the U.S. or maybe like a, two, a month and a half, two months. Um, so I had already felt like I had uprooted myself. I had already felt like I was outside of a norm for myself, um, like whatever that means as a as a as an artist in New York. But um, the the focus here was essentially to just come to studio every day and being in a place like this where there was I didn't have to be isolated into a small apartment and not see anyone. I did get to kind of interact with people even though it was sort of at a distance. Um, and it has, it has been helpful to feel this kind of sense of community that keeps getting reinforced um, rather than being completely alone. So it's been, there is a removal from my, my family and community and, and that's been difficult, but because we're all in that same boat here, we've all kind of gotten to connect as a result of that. 
which has been, it's been nice. It's been a, one of the more positive things about this past year. Um, what, uh, what have been the conversations um, that you've been having with fellow artists around these times? Uh, not only the pandemic uh, and everything that that involves, but also the recent uprisings and all of the political turmoil, turmoil that's happening um, around the country. Um, yeah, I think it's been a lot of both, I think a combination of both like shock and also not not being that surprised. I mean, something that's uh, that's important to say about Next Haven is that it's a, it, it's a it's a it's a black run organization, and most of the people here are people of color. Not I think all are people of color, and so being in a community where people tend to support each other and um, and and there's been a kind of there's just it's been there's been a sense of like understanding and all voices here are unique and amplified um, rather than all of us being kind of isolated. I think that's been kind of an important um, aspect of being here that, that that's, it's just, it's made it easier for all of us to continue to come to studio. It's been reinforced to all of us by the people that run the organization and by each other that that the best thing that we can all do now is continue to come to studio, continue to make work and continue to make our work, um, continue to make our voices uh, heard because the, our voices are all of value. And I think that's not something that all of us grew up knowing or have like been, it, it has not been reinforced to all of us. And also I think all of us here, I think all, what, like eight or seven or I forget how many of us there are, but all of us have been making work about this already for to, to varying degrees. I mean, I have kind of a, um, I always, through my work, I'm thinking about things like invasion and control and sort of seizing of power and colonization, rebellion and all of that as it relates to touch and intimacy and the body and um, the body in a constant state of recalibration. So all these things that are particularly charged now, they, they feel like they've always been in a part of my work and now they're a little bit less abstract, I guess. And so being in an environment where I get to communicate that with other artists that are in a, experiencing similar relationships to their work in this time, um, it just kind of keeps, it keeps the emphasis around uh, the studio and the time spent in here and, and the communication between each other and the support and collaboration around community. It, it, it just, it, yeah, going back to like, it doesn't feel like there's this kind of isolated relationship to this time. It feels like there's a kind of communal relationship to this time and to healing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, um, there's many artists uh, that have already been um, talking and observing uh, some of these fears and hopes uh, throughout their career. Um, and uh, for some of them, things have shifted. For some of them, things are kind of going to a different layer. Uh, I'm interested in hearing um, your observations around our relationship to the digital, which is something I know that you've uh, kind of been working on for some time. Um, and now it just feels like everything we are is digital. Um, well, for some of us. Uh, so how, how do you, what are your reflections around that? Um, yeah, it's funny because I've actually been kind of like bouncing off of the, uh, or butting up against the digital right now because um, over the past few months, uh, something that's happened with my work is that I've kind of been tapping back into things that I grew up around and that informed my narrative that I've sort of not really been, 
I took for granted and haven't hadn't really been talking about directly with my work. Um, and a lot of these things, um, the sort of ethos around, I grew up around the Colombian carnival. It was, I grew up in Marranquilla, which is where the Colombian carnival is hosted every year. And the kind of ethos around the carnivalesque and the, and the, um, the themes and, and aesthetics around it it have always had such a big impact on me that I've never, and my uh, aesthetic interest that I've never really allowed myself to, or not allowed, but I just never really accessed them as much in my work as I am now. And the sort of folklore around it is, is um, kind of, there's a sort of oral his, history tradition and around the Colombian carnival that it's really hard for me to access from a distance and hard for me to access digitally. Um, I'm talking a lot about intimacy and, and bodies relating to each other and relating to sort of power as it relates to bodies in, in states of recalibration and intimacy and touch and things that thinking about my social relationships being only accessed through a grid on a screen um, as talking heads, it's sort of, there's a kind of contradiction there that I've, ha I've been having a hard time reconciling and that's just in terms of that specificity. Um, I've kind of been like, I'm not quite sure even how to address that. Like being, not being able to have like geographical privilege to the, the things I want to talk about in my work. Um, yeah, I just kind of felt a little bit of like a disjointing um, with that. Um, and then I also realized that it's kind of hard to not talk about the sort of surveillance culture that we're all, the sort of threat of, of, of like in, invasive surveillance, like I said, and, and I've just kind of had to put that away to not think about it because it is overwhelming. Mm -hmm kind of loss of any type of privacy and what the threat that that has on people like me or people like the people I love, and communities like ours. Um, talking about surveillance, uh, do you think that um, some of those pieces are, are maybe missing from the narratives of this time or how do you, how do you see those kind of um, themes coming up or not coming up in, in the current discussions? Um, I might, honestly, I feel like I'm not as equipped to talk about it because I have been trying to ignore it. Mm -hmm. that, that's my only response, I think. And, and maybe the fact that I'm doing that, it, I think a lot of us are doing that because we kind of don't know how to deal with it. A lot, I've heard a lot of people just be like, I don't care about my privacy. Let's do this mass surveillance thing. Let's, that's the only way to handle this pandemic. And, and, and those aren't the same people that are watching uh, protesters be targeted. That are, those aren't the same people that are paying attention to the protesters that are being targeted by this type of surveillance and that are disappearing. I mean, like that's, that, that's there's a very clear history that, um, that deals with like the disappearing of people as a result of surveillance. And so I think that, um, yeah, sometimes I, I mean, there is a certain type of privilege that you have to be able to be like, I don't wanna think about it and, and not think about it. Um, and yeah, that's not lost on me, but it, it is, it gets overwhelming when I actually try to dive into that concept. I just, yeah, like I said, like I think communities like ours are the ones that suffer when there is a, that kind of surveillance. Um, so you previously mentioned um, your relationship to Barranquilla. Um, I'm not sure if you still have uh, your family connections there um, or other people, but I'm interested in um, hearing what has been your relationship uh, to them in these in these times and how you've navigated that. Um, yeah, mo I mean, most of my family is still there, and Marinki has suffered quite a lot as a result of COVID, and, and um, 
I don't know. I think a lot of it is just like the, actually like I, maybe I should, I'm not going to speculate on what it is, why it is, but I know that I haven't, I haven't been able to see my family um, because most, most if not all of my family are either in Barranquilla or they're in Miami, um, which is where we moved to when I was um, 13. So I haven't been able to, to, to be physically present and we are very kind of, we're, we're, I'm close to my family. I'm very lucky to have a big family and, and, um, and so that's been really hard. And then it's also been really hard to, like I said, not be able to be like physical. I had a, a lot of trips planned to Colombia as part of sort of research. I was supposed to go to the carnival, um, which I've, I haven't been to as an adult um, and, and actually have like direct conversations with people and, and collect my own imagery as research. And I haven't been able to do any of that because the carnival was canceled. And for the first time, I think since it started and, and if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, so it's just, it's been hard to be, to be distant from, from what the, the things that have a semblance of home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the carnival would have happened in March? So the carnival would have had the, the carnival for 2021. It's always at the beginning of the year. Um, oh, okay. um, so it was part of my plan to go a few times and then this year and then, uh, and then get there for the carnival. That's, it's always the three days before Lent. So whenever that lands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, can you just talk a little bit more about, I don't know if it's that work or any other work that you've been doing um, during this residency and also as a result or, or not of, of these times? Um, yeah, so, like I was saying, my work deals with power and intimacy and sort of the bodies that are deemed inconvenient for a concept of purity um, and how those bodies locate home and history and heritage. Um, and so I look to a lot of the kind of physical structure and like, I look to like a variety of different organisms and how power is sort of propelled through their physiological interactions. Like that's part of the way I, the way I research bodies for the work. Um, and so something like this virus has been really interesting to me because um, just in terms of like a, the concept of a virus um, being the sort of parasitic um, thing that, uh, like the behavior of a virus is very parasitic and that it can only thrive, it can only um, live and multiply and reproduce by attaching itself to a host cell. Um, and I think like societally, we've just all kind of been thinking about the themes around the parasitic and the invasive, the invasive and the kind of attack. Um, so I've just, I've been interested in the kind of clinical approach to bodies in that sense. Um, and thinking about power in this very kind of biological way. Um, and then thinking about how, some, I mean, something like a virus that is literally this, these, this is just particles. The size of a virus is tiny and yet it's this like, monumental seismic thing that has affected all of our lives. And so thinking about scale shift of bodies and having bodies coexist and, and, and how to kind of relate to bodies in, in a painting together through si like altering of size and altering of scale and like kind of thinking about ways of exposing power that way um, and, and, and control and things like that. So coupling that with the themes around the carnival that are sort of the sort of inversion of social norms and kind of um, grotesque body as a form of mockery, mockery as a sort of form of protest 
of authority and the kind of uncrowning of higher functions of thought. Co having these sort of themes coexist feels like it's all happening in a, in a much more cohesive way for me than it ever has. And I think it's in part because I have the, the space and time and kind of support here in this residency to do so. Um, but it's also because of, there's a very kind of acute experience with all of that, that, um, that feels less, ab less abstract than it has ever before. Mm -hmm. So it's, I've been able to sort of develop this and uh, this new body of work as a result of that. Um, where do you see your work um, going forward um, in the future? Um, how do you see these from the residency kind of like, where do you see yourself going from here? Um, excellent question. <laughs> and it's hard, it, that's been the hardest thing to think about is where things are going to go because it's hard to know. Like I have a, I have a, a show planned that is, it's even hard to imagine if it can or can't happen because last time people had shows planned, all the galleries closed and, and everything had to be rescheduled and watch. I feel so much is hinged on an election that's about to happen that, that the kind of handling of everything that's going on right now is, is hinged on who is president <laughs> or which administration is in power in, in like two months. So I, I feel like it's, it's been really hard to make plans and I'm kind of tr exercising a kind of uh, a new type of like submission to this, to the unknown right now. And which that's kind of something that feels like it's a collective thing. Like societally, we've all had to grown accustomed to the sort of, um, yeah, like a, like a kind of mass uh, complacency almost to the unknown. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's a few things that I, I'm really kind of staying with um, as we close this interview. So some I wrote some of these things down if in case you saw me like doing these, but I just wanted to capture here like inconvenient bodies, um, uncrowning of power, submission to the unknown. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of carry that with me as I think of these times. Um, and I also wanted to ask you if there's anything that we haven't discussed today that you'd like to just um, document and recording this interview before we finish. Um, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I'm sure there will be, but I can't think of it right now. That's that's fine. I just uh, wanted to offer that. Um, but um, if if um, if you're good. Um, I think uh, we have everything for now. Thank you so much for joining me again. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye.